Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Premier Chelsea, your source for all things Premier League, but starting with Chelsea first. Coming to you on your speakers and headsets, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jackie from Houston, and I have my very good friend here, Rahul. You're in Connecticut, but your background shows you're in London right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm top of the table. I was going to say, top <laughs> of the table in London, that's exciting. Hey, yeah. it looks like International Week is over, and so you're starting to get back into the swing of Premier League, huh? I can't wait, but before that, we have to share that we're celebrating our first birthday. So yeah. there is some excitement here for that, as well as the Premier League coming back and uh, no more international break till March. So from here on out, we're just going to be seeing our boys in blue. A very, very happy birthday to the Premier Chelsea. That's you and I, of course. And Alex jumped on along this ride somewhere down the line. And so it's been an exciting one year for us. That's been a good journey. I think we've had a lot of fun. I hope some of the listeners have had a lot of fun listening to us, but definitely exciting. And yes, I, I'll, I'll add on top of that, no more international break. And I'll be very honest with you. I watched zero international football this last break. So you'll have to get us started today. Let's do it. So World Cup qualifying has been going on uh, and there has been some drama, some games, some blowouts. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen even yeah. just the results, but We'll start with uh, some of the teams that have already qualified. And while we do that, we'll touch on uh, some of the results uh, in the last 10 days or so. So uh, Qatar being the host nation, they have qualified. Um, but some of the other teams that are going to be joining them are Germany, which a household name and, and usually a regular at, at the World Cup uh, has joined them. And they actually capped off a, a great qualification campaign with a 9-0 win against Liechtenstein. Yeah, big numbers there. I mean, no disrespect to Liechtenstein. I think Germany is a little bit better quality on the football field, but 9 nil is a tough pill to swallow, I bet. It is, but Germany, that's what they do. And I uh, saw a meme going around of their manager, Hansi Flick, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and he just always, no matter how many goals his team has scored, just has a <laughs> straight face. <laughs> Um, but that's that's the man and that's the mission that he's put his team on. But moving on to Denmark, uh, another name that's pretty much at every tournament and they have qualified as well. And they did it, I believe, unbeaten up until the last game where they lost to Scotland, who have themselves made it into the playoffs for the World Cup. So not a bad situation to be in. Yeah, definitely. And with our Danish Maldini in the back, they're helping them. It's exciting to see that they're going to do probably pretty well considering what we saw in euros as well yeah yeah definitely uh moving to south america real quick brazil have qualified and, and no surprises there no. Uh, argentina joined them as well from from uh the continent uh coming back to europe we have france again uh, uh, the holders of the competition actually yep. so it'll be good to see them back and they themselves inspired from the germany uh <laughs> result won eight nil against kazakhstan yeah, another big thrashing over there. And some of these countries that are not necessarily up to par with a Germany or a France or, uh, you know, Brazil or Argentina, it's tough to swallow. But at the same time, I think it's nice to see some of these smaller countries at least try and show up to these games and put in their best foot forward. Now, sometimes they get trampled on and that's OK. It's part of the learning experience for these countries to grow and come out from. Yeah, definitely. And Mbappe getting four goals in that game, and I believe he... He equaled a record that has stood for 63 years. I'm just trying to see uh, what actually the record is that a player to score four plus goals for France since 1958, and that was just Fontaine. Wow. So a, a long-standing record that he's now equaled. Yes, against it was it was against Kazakhstan, but <laughs> you, you can only beat who's put in front of you. So of course. Um, this game and this team, uh, Serbia. I mean, they're, they're a household name in Europe and in, in, in uh, international tournaments, but the way they did this was quite impressive because they had a, a basically a, a final or a playoff game against Portugal, and the winner of this was going to qualify, um, or a draw, which was suiting Portugal, was going to be okay. But right. Serbia popped up 90th, 92nd minute or so and scored a goal that put them top of the table and takes them to the World Cup next year. Yeah, it was a shocking one, not because Serbia can't win a game. Of course, they can win a game. But I think in the manner of which it happened, last minute goal squeezed in through the corner there. I think it was off a corner or off a cross, but squeezed into the corner of the post between the post and the goalkeeper. And 
uh, wonderful scenes on on Serbia side specifically. I'm not going to get into the Portuguese side of the camp because I think now they have to go back and qualify again, right? Yeah, they they themselves also go into the playoffs, like right. we we're talking about with Scotland. Uh, and there was some banter from Mitrovic, who's actually scored the goal. He was drinking Coca Cola. This game was in <laughs> Portugal, so the 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 news was he's drinking Coca Cola in Ronaldo's home. He was eating pizza. It was just. It was fun to watch because they enjoyed it and they definitely deserved it on the night uh, and in the qualification because you don't end up top of the table by just beating one team. So congratulations to them, Spain, uh, and our boys, Espelicueta and Alonso. Uh, Alonso, I don't think, made it to the squad this time around, but Aspie did. Uh, and they are also going to the World Cup. But speaking of Aspie, he got bulldozed by Ibrahimovic, which was surprising because I don't know what Aspie did to him, but... He came on full on on with his shoulder and just like clotheslined him. Yeah, that's Ibrahimovic. I think sometimes he sees red. There's nothing you can really say about that. But Ashby Lequeta is a tough, tough warrior. I'm sure he's back up and ready to go after this. Oh, he was. He was back up. And I think Ibro got a yellow card, but they've not reviewed. And I think they were going to say he might get suspended or so for a game. But uh, moving on, Croatia, who made it to the final uh, four years ago or three years ago at this point uh, are going back and hoping maybe they can go a step further. So congratulations to them. Switzerland, who were in a group with Italy, who won the Euros. Uh, Switzerland finished top and Italy now have to go into playoffs, which another big team in the playoffs. Yeah, a little bit of a surprise given the nature of how they controlled the Euros and went on like a 30-something game unbeaten run and all that. So a little bit of a surprise, but maybe a bit of a wake-up call as well for Italy. You know, people have figured out how they play. They need to kind of shift things and make things happen if they want to move forward in this competition. Absolutely. And and a good wake-up call for if they do want to make it to the World Cup or end up there, how right. do they navigate that? Uh, I'll skip England now for just a second. We'll go to Netherlands, and then we'll come back to England. So Netherlands are back at the World Cup. Uh, I believe they missed the last one, but uh, they will be going to Qatar as well. And, and Van Dijk, a name that we're all very familiar with, at least from the Premier League, will be making his uh, first international tournament debut uh, at the age of 30, 31. So um, kind of late in his career, but it finally comes. It comes indeed. And it's a good time for him. I mean, you know, he's he was unlucky to miss out with an injury a few years ago with the Euros. And then before that, he was kind of at Southampton, if I'm not mistaken. And so didn't necessarily get seen or picked as one of the first choices out there. So I think it's a good thing, and he seems to be, at least in the first few games of the Premier League, uh, quote-unquote, back to his best. And so I think it's going to make for an interesting World Cup to see the, the top players out there. That's what we all want to see. Absolutely. And so speaking of top players and a lot of players that we're familiar with are in the England squad. Um, our boys, Reese James, Ben Chilwell made it. Uh, Connor Gallagher eventually got called up, so congratulations to him. Mason Mount did miss out due to his wisdom tooth issue that he's been having um and speaking of that if you haven't seen the video of him coming out of (laughs) surgery go go check it out it's pretty funny uh but england themselves had a good last 10 days or so they uh beat albania and then they went on to play san marino and yes on paper and and on the odds england are favored but they did quite a job on san marino and scored 10 goals without a response from the other side. Yeah, look, you've already called some pretty incredible scorelines here with 9-0 for Germany, 8-0 for France. And like I said earlier, I didn't get a chance to watch any of these games, but I'm sitting at at the office and plugging away at my work and I get a random text message from you saying, England are winning 10-0. And I was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) Yes, it's San Marino, no disrespect to them, but 10-0 is is quite a shocker indeed. And what's interesting, Raul, a few weeks earlier, the Lionesses, actually went on to beat Latvia 10-0 as well, which is it's just crazy to think about the talent that's coming out of England, both on the men's and the women's side as well. Yeah, and we were, you know, like we were saying with the other teams, Germany and France, you can only beat who's put in front of you. Uh, and it would almost be unprofessional to kind of give up after four or five goals because you, right. you know the game's over, uh, but to just kind of disrespect in the form that we're not going to put in an effort here. Uh, but also scoring 10 goals kind of kind of rubs the other team's <laughs> face in, in defeat. Uh, but San Marino, all credit to them. They're not full-time, most of those guys, uh, uh, football or soccer players, but they come out and, and 
go through every qualification and in hopes that they'll make it. And someday, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for them, they will. Uh, but England, Harry Kane looking good. Phil Foden, Conor Gallagher made his debut. Like I said, Reese James in that first game against Albania picked up an assist pretty early. And he looked good. He had a nasty collision with John Stones that had me a little bit concerned, but he got back up in his beast form uh, and, and continued. So it's good to see and um, good to see that our boys didn't come away with any injuries. So that coming back into the Premier League, and we will touch on that in, in just a few minutes, um, they're ready to go. But uh, moving to Africa real quick. So we're from our backgrounds from Ghana and I did want to talk about just the qualification in Africa. So uh, nothing's been decided yet. They also have like a playoff structure coming up in March where Algeria, Cameroon, Congo, Egypt, Ghana, uh, Mali, Morocco, Nigeria, Senegal, and Tunisia will fight off and there'll be a draw in terms of what the fixtures will be. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye out for them. And obviously the African cup of nations is coming up too in uh, early next year. So uh, some good football coming out of that continent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if the African Cup of Nations goes on a schedule, I think that's going to be a very interesting one to watch. And even if you're not a fan of international football and you don't have a chance to watch it, I think it's interesting to pay attention to because you've got the likes of Liverpool that might lose Mane. They might lose uh, their main talisman in Mohamed Salah. Chelsea might lose their Edwal Mendy over here. And so it gets really, really interesting. So it might affect the way the Premier League continues over that those January, February months as this thing plays out. So uh, I'll be tuned in, uh, obviously, as a Ghana fan. I want to see how we do over there. But with the African Cup of Nations in mind as well, it could affect Chelsea's Premier League form. Yeah, but we'll, we'll touch on that in, the, in about a month's time. Uh, but speaking of Chelsea in the Premier League, they're both back like Slim Shady, I guess. Um, and it's been almost two weeks since our last game against Burnley, which we've covered uh, pretty extensively in the last episode, but uh, almost a chance to reset and start again and take this as the next segment of the season, which is a pretty long segment. Like we said, it goes all the way through to March. Uh, and for us, there's some tough, tough fixtures coming. But before we get into that, let's just talk about some of the last uh, few fixtures that we keep, we went into from af before, after the last international break, before this one. Uh, so, I'll let you kind of read off some of those results and then we can just discuss and, and see how that sets us up for the next few months. Yeah, I'll jump through, just give you a high level roundabout of the games and then we'll kind of dissect them as we go through it. So we played four games before this international break. First one coming back was Brentford, which we all knew was going to be a tough match for sure. But Chelsea get away with the win one nail over there. And it sounds it sounds less and I think I want more from Chelsea, but we'll we'll break into that in just a second here. Then we play Norwich, and it should be on paper an easy game, and it ends up being an easy game. Seven nailed to Chelsea, and now we're joining some of the international statistics <laughs> we talked about here just a minute ago. Newcastle, again, another game, new ownership, different changes going on around <laughs> there. So we were a little bit nervous about it, but ends up being a 3 nail win, which is exciting. And then we want to wrap up strong. We want to wrap up with all the points that we possibly can in the Premier League. We go to Burnley. We're in full control. One nail, don't put them to bed, and they come back to make it 1-1, one, one, and that's how we wrap up those four games. And on paper, it should have been four out of four wins. No yeah. disrespect to any of those teams, but uh, the way we started 1-0 against Brentford, which at that point, they were flying and, and doing pretty well. Uh, then we go to Norwich, and we know the issues there. And then Newcastle away is another tough fixture. But then to drop points right before the international break, uh, hurt a little bit, but it's an opportunity to start again. And, and we start again with another, uh, a tough fixture. I won't say another because uh, some of the ones we had before this international break were relatively straightforward, but Leicester away. And, and it's a rematch from the FA Cup final last season. It's a rematch from the, I guess, Battle of Stamford Bridge part two. Uh, but I personally like to refer to it as the Dan Daniel Lamarde Memorial match. Um, but jokes aside, it should be it should be a tough game, but let's get your thoughts on it. Yeah, look, honestly, if you asked me this question maybe a year ago, I would be a bit more nervous. And I don't want to come off as very, very confident. That's not my, my uh, idea over here. But at the same time, Leicester don't seem to be performing at the same rate that they were performing last season. I think we just have to all be honest here. I think they're sitting 12th in the league, 15 points. We're sitting first in the league with 26 points. So there's a decent amount of 
uh, of difference in points and difference in play. They're not firing all cylinders. Yes, they can be dangerous on any given day. Don't get don't get me wrong. Like I said, you've got the likes of Vardy, you've got the likes of Ndidi, you've got Madison yet to fire Harvey Barnes. I mean, they have a good squad, Rahul, and so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But I'm not nervous. I think just on on recent form and everybody how things are going we should be able to control this game and at least try and get a draw out of it at the very least in my opinion yeah and i think that's fair because we've i mean we've played lesser like i said last two times at the end of last season but before that um we played them under lampard and, and we lost and that was one of the the nails in his coffin but uh, we generally tend to to get a result against Leicester, and it's whether that's at home or away um, even if it's just a draw, and I think I'm thinking back to Leicester's start of the season, and it was kind of slow. Uh, they had some issues. They've picked it up, but just looking at the last five games, they drew against Burnley, drew against Crystal Palace. They had that win against Manchester United, but everybody seems to win against Manchester United. Right. Um, I'll bite my tongue maybe next weekend, but we'll save it for then. Uh, they beat Brentford as well, Leicester did, and then they lost against Arsenal and drew against Leeds. So it's been kind of up and down and, and not picking up three points uh, regularly. So I'm sure they themselves and Brendan Rodgers will be taking the international break in this opportunity to kind of reset, see where they've been and, and how to proceed moving forward because they do have ambitions to be top four and, and make it into Europa League at a minimum. So uh, it should be a tough game. And I, with the international break, you just don't know even between now and, and Saturday injuries can happen travel delays can happen and, and and impact our players or even Leicester's players uh and for our last five we just covered some of them so I don't I don't think we need to go into them but uh let's get a starting 11 like we usually do and uh we have some players coming back from injury uh so maybe you may want to include them into your lineup yeah I mean I think we always discuss goalkeeper and I wonder why we discuss goalkeeper while Mendy's fit. Mendy has got to play. I think that's kind of standard at this point. I know early on in the season, Thomas Tuchel said he would go based on form, but this guy is just in red hot form and you're not going to displace him unless he makes several mistakes. So Mendy in goal uh, going to the back three, I think you're going to go, want to go with Aspilicueta at right center back. He, like you said, he did get a, a pushed over or bottled over or whatever, but he's, he's a strong lad. He's back ready to go. My Danish Maldini may play in the central midfield, a central defensive position, just with Thiago Silva age and travel and all that fun stuff. Uh, Rudiger will play that left center back position. We've said as long as Rudiger's fit, he's in the form of his life. He's playing for a contract. He may not stay with this contract uh, negotiations going on, but he plays while he's here. You go into Reese James at right wing back. I think he's a, a man rich in form, both for club and country. Left wing back, I think Ben Chilwell has now solidified that spot and kind of pushed Alonso out to second choice, which is, there's no shame in that at all. Middle of the park, I think you got to play Kante. I think he's back and moving again with fitness, and so you got to keep playing him. Jorginho seems to maybe have won a little bit of Thomas Tuchel's heart, and so he's going to continue playing in that role. But look, if Kovacic comes in as well, uh, I, I've got no qualms or problems over there. The front three is where it gets interesting, Rahul. I think we've had some injury problems. We've had some uh, form problems, if you want to call it that. And so just based on everything, I think Kai Havertz holds on to that number nine position. He's done okay in it. And so it's going to be a, a tougher test with Leicester in this particular game. The two behind him, I think Callum hudson Odoi has been playing really, really well. And so Without him traveling, without him going to the under-21s, which is a bit of controversy there, he's fresh, he's ready to go. He's got to start this game. And that last position, I think Mason Mount is a good shout to get in there. But I would not be upset if Christian Pulisic was able to slide into that position as well. The man in the mirror, you mean. Uh, the man in the mirror, absolutely. <laughs> and I guess if for people that don't know what we're referring to, at least on the Pulisic, we'll just break away just for a second to talk about that. Uh, he was on the subs bench for the U.S. against Mexico, which is a, uh, a tasty rivalry, uh, at least in this part of the world. And it was a World Cup qualifier being played in Ohio. Pulisic was on the bench. It was nil-nil. And he comes on around the 70-minute minute, minute mark and within minutes gets his first goal and uh, the U.S.'s first goal and makes it 1-0 and, and lifts his shirt up and says, man in the mirror. And Jackie, I'll let you explain the whole whole process behind that shirt. 
Yeah. So like you said, I mean, there's a lot of rivalry between the USA and Mexico. And I think mostly because of proximity, they're always playing each other in CONCACAF and World Cup qualifiers, whatever you want to call it. And their goalkeeper, who, by the way, is, is a pretty big name in not only Mexican football, but world football. And I don't want to say his first name wrong. is Guillermo Ocha. And he has played for some pretty big clubs around the world as well. And he's made some comments regarding man in the mirror, basically stating that the USA sees themselves as Mexico is being better than USA, if I've explained that as clearly as I can. But what I want to take away from this, Rahul, is that the confidence of Christian Pulisic, one, to wear that shirt, but two, thinking he's going to score and that's why he's going to wear that shirt, and then three, pulling it up to say, I'm not going to talk too much, but I'm the man in the mirror, so you talk next, Ocho, and we'll <laughs> see how that plays out there. Yeah, and to, and to add to that, Greg Berhalter, the U.S. manager, had said a, a day or two before the game, Pulisic's not going to start. He's going to be on the bench. And Pulisic in his mind is like, well, whatever time you give me is going to be enough for me to get a goal. So I am going to have this shirt, like you said, and it's going to be ready, loaded to go. And, and man pops up with the goal and, and lifts the shirt and gets the U.S. their first goal. And then I think Weston Kenny Weston gets McKinney, the second. Yeah. Gets the second and and U.S. win two nil and another joke or another kind of banter thing is a uh, dosa zero, which is basically two nil um, in Spanish and it's a, a, a common score line between these two, and every time the U.S. has won, it's turned into dosa zero and and that continued and um, this is the third time the U.S. has beaten Mexico in the last six months, so it's kind of turning into uh, a good rivalry and, and fun and act. sometimes it's very heated on the pitch yeah. too. So um, it's been, it's been good, but yeah, coming back to, sorry, just before ahead. that, I think, I think you need to make another meme of Christian Pulisic saying, I took that personally and then make sure you show him that shirt <laughs> coming up the top because he, t- he definitely took that personally. Yes. He didn't say too much about it, but again, just having it ready to go, shows me he took that personally and he wanted to send some stinking stinging feelings back to the Mexican public there. <laughs> he did. And it was good because now I can't wait to see him in the Chelsea shirt. So coming back to Chelsea, I, w- I was actually going to ask you when you were giving the lineup. Uh, he's now made two appearances for the U.S. We mentioned one against Mexico. The second one was against uh, Jamaica, again, uh, off the bench. Uh, so his minutes have been managed very well. Uh, he was kind of coming off the bench for Chelsea already before this break. So is, do you, if he's ready, do you play him over Mason or hudson Adoy? Yeah, absolutely. For me, I think I've said this for many, many episodes. I think Christian Pulisic, a fully fit Christian Pulisic on his day, is one of our best players in the squad. I think because what I've seen, Rahul, is that when teams notice that Chelsea have a lot of the ball, they tend to sit deep and kind of protect what they have or or going back to Burnley, protect a nail-nail or get a one-nail and wait till the very end and then open up. But Christian Pulisic is somebody who drives to the byline, cuts through players, dribbles, finds a pass, does a flick, does a trick. He's got that X factor. And Callum Hudson-Odoi has that as well, so I don't want to take that away from Callum, but I think that's something we haven't seen two X factor players. It takes me back to the Josie Mourinho days where you've got Robin and Duff on either side of a striker, and it's like, my God, that just whets your appetite and seeing like tricks, flicks, crosses. And I'd love to see that if possible. And Mason, yes, he's been out. Yes, he should be fit, but maybe he's not match fit. And so him coming off the bench would be great as well. Yeah, and I think that's fair because if Pulisic has been getting the minutes, been kind of already in a in a, an advanced uh, fitness level, at least right. compared to Mason, uh, he could be a good choice. So I I wouldn't disagree with with that if he comes in. I think Hudson Adoy deserves it. I agree with yeah. you. He's been he's been good and he's been good in that attacking three. I know uh, Tuchel has been playing him sometimes out as the wing back, but I think in that three he's shown what he brings. Uh, you wouldn't bring in Lukaku, who we've seen is back in training uh, into no. this game. Yeah, I don't want to rush him back in. I think you don't spend a hundred million to. Yes, you want him to play every game, but you don't spend a hundred million and he has a little bit of a nick niggle or, or a nickel on his leg. He comes back and gets injured again. And I just want to come back to, to Pulisic and, and Callum. It's just, it's getting me very excited because here's the deal. I think James or Chilwell both have given independent 
comments or interviews about how Tuchel's asked him to play more internally. Right. And I think those two being more quote unquote natural wingers will bring that with and allow these two to come in. And come James in, yeah. and Chilwell are on such good form that that makes me really excited for goals. And again, I don't want to get overconfident, don't want to get cocky <laughs> saying we're going to thump Leicester, but I think that could work. It really could work as a, as a starting 11. Yeah. So, okay. Havertz up top. Uh, we spoke about Cho, Hudson, and Doan Pulisic. We spoke about James and Cho will kind of basically pick themselves. Conte and Jorginho, I think, is fair. Kovacic, I don't know if he's fully back yet uh, from that hamstring injury. He may still need another week. So, he's, those two are a good option. Maybe Loftus Cheek uh, yeah. from the bench. Uh, I agree with you. Christensen plays just because of Thiago Silva's travel and, and COVID um, protocols that come into play from being in South America. Uh, Aspie, fair, fair choice. And then Rudiger, who tends to always find, at least in the last few years, a goal against Leicester. Uh, so uh, definitely a good choice to put in there. And then you touched on his contract. I think uh, it's a situation where it's kind of getting drawn out now. I think both parties are maybe waiting to see what happens in January right. and, and who comes in for him. Uh, because one way or another, if he does have a lot of interest and at this point you think he would, Chelsea's hand would be forced to maybe agree to some of those higher wages. On the other hand, if teams don't come in, then maybe Chelsea can say, we, we want you here. Why don't you accept maybe not where you want to be, but something lower and, and it works out for both, for both parties. Uh, but I think that's a stronger lineup. And Mendy, like you said, no no questions there. Uh, so definitely a good lineup and enough to see us through on any day. But you never know with, with an early kickoff, the first kickoff back from an international break, it should be uh, a little rusty, I would say, a little tense, a little tight between two good teams. And uh, that brings me to the question of what's the, the score line here? All I want, Rahul, is a one nil. That's all I'm going to go. <laughs> Usually, I'm the confident guy asking for the three or the four. I think I just want a one nil. Not not because I don't think we can score a lot. I think missing Lukaku, missing Timo Werner, those kind of players that have been helping put the ball in the net. Havertz is doing a good job at number nine, but it's not his his favorite position. One nil is good for me. As long as we defend well and and get a goal, I think that should be enough. Yeah, I think a 2-1, as long as we get that first goal, like we saw in that FA Cup final, right. um, Leicester are going to sit deep, are going to play tight, are going to maybe match us system for system, man for man. Uh, and we know Rodgers knows how to prepare his team. So if we don't get that first goal and they do, I think that makes it tough for us. But uh, I, I trust in us and I trust in our defenders in the absence of the goals from the attackers. <laughs> Uh, to get it. And if nothing else, we have James and Chilwell to exactly. kind of help out. So I think 2-1 for me, and that would maintain my um, background here and keep us top of the table. Uh, but let's talk about some of the other fixtures and, and maybe some managerial updates that have happened in the last few weeks. So uh, I'll let you start with uh, maybe Stevie G. Yeah, it's a little bit of an interesting managerial merry-go-round, if I can say that. So Steven Gerrard comes into Aston Villa because Dean Smith was let go. And it's an interesting one because he's done very, very, very well for himself at Rangers. He had stopped the, I think what they call the 10. Yeah. Uh, Celtic were going nine in a row. This was going to be the attempt. And Steven Gerrard comes in and says, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Rangers are taking this one. And he did a very good job organizing them, getting them in there. And he was doing a good job uh, starting off this season so far until uh, Dean Smith gets the sack and, and they bring him into Aston Villa. So it's going to be, it's going to be a big jump in my opinion to move from the Scottish Premier League, where traditionally it's Rangers versus Celtic. Yes, you can get a couple of outsiders, but those two, to going to the Premier League, where Aston Villa were high flyers last year, struggling this year. You're coming into a whole different realm, a whole different culture. I mean, he's a Liverpool boy coming into Birmingham, so we'll see how that all plays out. And then on the opposite side of the merry-go-round, Dean Smith, who immediately gets fired from Villa gets a job with Norwich at the bottom of the table. And I know we were talking about Frank Lampard coming in there and he seemed to not want to touch this, but Dean Smith was ready to jump back into action. So I'll ask you a couple of questions before we go into the big games for Aston Villa. Is Steven Gerrard a good signing for manager? I mean, I think so. Based on what, who was out there and, and the managers that were available, like you mentioned, Steven Gerrard has been at Rangers for a few years. He's put in the hard work. He's, 
got them for a position where they weren't competing with Celtic. Like you said, it's basically a two league team and Celtic had turned it into a one league team and, and <laughs> Steven Gerrard made the, brought Rangers back and um, got them at the title, got them playing well. I think they went for a while without losing a game. Uh, so clearly he's done the hard work and training and, and got his team where he needed to be. So I think for Aston Villa, they needed a change and they identified Steven Gerrard as that, as the man to make them come back from, you know, the, the drop in form that they've had. Uh, and I think for him, it's a great opportunity to prove himself in the Premier League. And, and I don't want to say it's a stepping stone because Villa are, are, are a big team themselves and, <laughs> and European champions in the past. So uh, I, for him, I think it's a great opportunity to showcase to the world, not just um, to, to the British media and, and fans and at Rangers, to the world that he could be a good manager and he could eventually maybe make a case to be Liverpool manager someday. So in the most nicest possible terms, you said stepping stone. So I get that. <laughs> but let, let's move on. Let's talk about Dean Smith, Rahul. Look, I'm sitting here as a neutral. I have no investment whatsoever in Norwich. But I wonder, as a Norwich fan, as a Norwich player, I'm sitting there going, Aston Villa, not that far above us. They're struggling themselves. The, the board of Aston Villa look around and say, you're not doing a good job. We're going to can you. And Norwich says, come on over to us. We'll take you and maybe you can help us. I'm not saying anything disrespectful to Dean Smith. I think he's a wonderful manager. He showed that last year. Bits of this season as well, it just wasn't working out. So they've done the right thing to help Aston Villa. But how do you feel as a Norwich player or a fan saying, is Dean Smith the right guy coming in? I mean, it's you've got to realize that it's not just for this season, right? It's not saying we're bringing a, a survival specialist as a Sam Allardyce or or one of those guys. It's It's a way to plan beyond just this season so if in case they do go down dean smith has the credentials and the ability to bring them back up now daniel farco could have done that too right. but with him it seemed like they were just destined to go down right away with dean smith they seem to have given themselves maybe a chance to to fight and and stay in this league and not even worry about going down uh, because he's stayed with aston villa in a couple of seasons ago he's kind of then progressed them on and uh, I think it's a good move for him, and I think it's a good move for Norwich because he'll go in and shake things up and, and get them, the players, I mean, get them refreshed and, and believing in maybe staying in the league and um, something they may have been lacking under under Daniel Farker. Yeah, only time will tell. We'll have to see how this plays out. Specifically with Dean Smith, I think it's going to be a very, very tough tough situation to get out being bottom of the table with five points and, and safeties another five, six points away. But Let's jump into Jared's first game in management. It's going to be versus Brighton, and they seem to be the high flyers this season. I see in your background there, they're sitting in sixth or seventh, so punching well above their weight. Is this a, an easy game for Gerard? Is it going to be a tough one? It's going to be a tough one. It's Brighton come in in good form. They drew against Liverpool most recently, uh, and they've been getting some good results. I know they dropped a few points against Manchester City, but that can happen in all the pressure here is on Aston Villa and Steven Gerrard to start off and make an impression. And uh, I think Brighton and Graham Porter um, come in and will play exactly the way they have been. And, and maybe they'll get shocked, but maybe they will end up shocking Aston Villa and, and um, Steven Gerrard. So it should make a good game. And uh, if I had to predict, I think Aston Villa would take it just because of the new manager bounce, but uh, I wouldn't take anything away from Brighton. If I'm a betting man, I'm betting on Villa as well, Rahul, because Brighton have had uh, four draws and one loss in the last five games. So not as bad as Aston Villa, who went five on the loss, right. but new manager and and, Ast and Brighton kind of going down in form. If I was to bet, I'd bet on Villa. But let's talk about our favorite team to cover over here, and that's Manchester United. One week we talk about them and they're high flyers, and then we criticize them. And the next week we say they're doing really, really well, and then they come back down and... <laughs> Reality strikes. And so I, I wonder what we're going to say this week, but Watford versus Manchester United. Watford, another team that's been yo-yo here and there. So thoughts on this game? I Honestly, I, I don't know because you, you on paper and looking at the fixture, you think, all right, Manchester United should have enough. But you, when you expected the most from them, they, they don't seem to perform. But again, I think this last two weeks, or at least the last 10 days in, in the international break, has been an opportunity. Now, I know 
everyone's been talking about how Solskjaer has traveled away and, and gone away on holiday with his family instead of maybe staying at the training ground <laughs> and, and, and preparing some new tactics. But maybe that's all he needed was a break away from the media, away from players, away from the training. And he may come back refreshed and ready to go again and, and surprise us and move up the table as he usually does in, in this part of the season. So um, I think United should win it. But Watford and Renieri will also be fired up. So Watford lost to Liverpool, Man you lost to Liverpool. <laughs> if I do the math, it should be a draw. <laughs> <laughs> Look, one, one thing I'll say, Rahul, about, about Manchester United and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, I think he, he on paper, uh, based on the last few seasons, he probably might not be the right man to take Manchester United long-term to the next step. That's just my opinion. He, he might turn it around, like we've said many times, and continue and bring them up to second, third. It doesn't matter, right? What I do like about Solskjaer is I think he's got a positive outlook and attitude about things. There are many times, and I'll bring it back to the Chelsea experience, where we're not doing so well, and the media tends to put so much pressure on the manager. And how many times have we seen Jose Mourinho snap and crack? And how many times have we seen Antonio Conte growl and get aggressive towards managers and then you look at Sari who of course there was a little bit of a language barrier but would get really really frustrated with the English media and towards the end of Lampard's career who I thought was probably one of the most composed managers when it came to the English media you could see him starting to, to dig into the media but Solskjaer has a good way of keeping it positive and saying you know what I have a good relationship with the board we keep communicating He's giving an interview and the fans are insulting him. And he says, hey, guys, you can abuse me in just a minute. Let me finish this interview and you can continue. He just keeps that banter of nothing's going to break me. And I think that's that's an admirable feature to have. And so maybe this holiday was good for him to reset this negativity around Manchester United. And he can come back and, again, my money's on them to, to beat Watford. So we'll see how that plays out here. But let's jump into another one. Huge game here. Liverpool versus Arsenal. And... It's only a huge game in recent weeks. If you had asked me this maybe eight <laughs> weeks ago, it was Liverpool you know, marauding over Arsenal. But now they sit kind of back-to-back -back in the table, fourth and fifth. So give me your feelings on this one. I, I agree with you. I think a few weeks ago, we'd say Liverpool win this easily. But like you said, Arsenal have made a recovery, have come back and not lost in, I believe, 10 games. Yep. Um, picking up draws, picking up wins, picking up, clean sheets along the way. Ramsdale, who himself made his England debut. Um, and you, I've got to put my hand up and say, I was pretty critical of him last season. I think I called him the worst signing of the season. And the uh, season, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's turned it around and, and that's credit to him and credit to Arteta, who, like we said for Ole, Arteta was going through some uh, rough waters at the beginning of the season and everyone wanted his head and he's turned it around and, now he comes and faces maybe his arguably his biggest test since Man City, which was about two months ago, three months ago. Uh, and Liverpool themselves have some injury issues. I'm looking at it here. It says Robertson may be out. Henderson may be out. Mane may be out. Curtis Jones is out. Keita may be out. Firmino is out. We, as we know, Milner may be out. So with those injuries and with Liverpool's bench, I, I don't know if they have enough. Uh, especially against an Arsenal that's feeling good about themselves and, and want to test themselves against a good team. Um, it's going to be a tough game, but I think Liverpool at home should have enough with and then when Salah on any given day can easily pull a team from, from a draw to a win. So I think it's going to end up as a draw, but um, Salah could be the deciding factor here. Yeah, spot on analysis on the bench. I think that's what it's really going to come down to should they have all those injuries. I think that's where it's going to hurt them a little bit. But I'll be happy with the draw, Rahul. It helps keep them away from us. But let's talk about another rival that's playing this weekend, and that's Manchester City versus Everton. Where do you see this game playing out? If you had asked me two weeks ago, before I'd watched Everton Spurs, I would have said Man City win this. But Everton seemed to have put in a good shift and um i think they should maybe surprise man city here especially with oh, right. uh man city at home the last game was against palace where they had some issues um if everton defend and, and do the the basics right against city which who will have most of this ball um 
Everton may have an opportunity, maybe nick it on the counter, but I can't go against City. <laughs> <laughs> Things we like to hear. Everton are going to have an opportunity against Manchester City. I don't see it going too well for Everton, to be very honest with you, given their form and Manchester City just having that depth of squad. I think they can just turn it up when they want to. Maybe the, the Palace one might have just been a blip. So let's wrap up the weekend, Rahul. Tottenham versus Leeds United and Antonio Conte coming against... Marcelo Bielsa, you're talking about two managers that like to run their clubs with an iron fist here. Who, who takes the top of this? Oh, man, that's it's going to be a good game. Leeds yep. have been off the boil, I would say, compared to last season. And I think that's where this is going to get decided is Tottenham first game for Conte at home in the Premier League. Um will be fired up. They will have opportunities. Harry Kane coming off of, I believe, seven goals in two games for England. Um, the only issue I think for Tottenham right now is Romero, who's their center back, went off injured for Argentina. So that could be a sticky situation, but I can't go against Tottenham with the form, with Conte wanting to just get started on his um, Premier League points or wins. Uh, so I'll, I'll go for Tottenham. All right. I think that's going to make another interesting game. I'm going to try and push it towards a draw. That's my hope for it because... <laughs> If, if Conte can't get running pretty quickly, I think it's going to send a big message about the team and these players, and maybe they're not really up for, for challenging for big things, but it remains to be seen. So that's going to be a fun-filled weekend here. I agree. And, and Premier League is back, and uh, weekends will be pretty busy from now on out if they weren't already uh, with, the, with everything going on with Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, but... Before we wrap it up, I did want our listeners to know that we're not covering the Chelsea women's in this episode just because of time. Uh, we want to dedicate a full episode to them. So uh, later this week, we will be covering just the women um, and releasing that episode. So keep an eye out for it. And uh, if you have any ideas for what you'd like to, to hear about the Chelsea women or, or just um, that squad in general, send us a message and, and we'll try to cover it. But if that wraps it up, guys, thank you very much for listening. Please continue to subscribe, like, and follow us. Like we said, we're celebrating our first birthday. So thank you very much to everyone that's that's followed, that's listened, that's commented, that's listened and unfollowed. Um, we're, we're still here and, and we will continue to be here. Uh, and it's at the Premier Chels on Apple, Spotify, Google, and Instagram. And on Twitter, it's at Premier Chels. Uh, and we will be back, like I said, with an episode, special episode on just the Chelsea women. Uh, and then we will look forward to this weekend and have some predictions and stuff going on Instagram. But until then, stay safe and up the Chelsea.